and welcome to the Journey Church Podcast, and thank you for joining us today. We hope that this podcast encourages and challenges you to help you grow in your faith. So enjoy the message. All right. You know, the first Sunday, if you didn't get this, you can go back on our, let's see, you can go back on our website, you can go back on our Journey Church app. Uh, that you can download off any of uh, any places of uh, stores for app stores. Uh, you can go on YouTube and watch. You can watch through the, the Facebook page and get the first two sessions of this. The first week we talked about how the enemy is the deceiver. He's the liar. He constantly lies. And we talked about that week one. Last week in week two, we talked about how the devil is the accuser of the brethren, okay? And I, I thought it was really ironic in the last week if you learned this, he will lie to get you to get involved in something that won't bless you. And then when you do step into that thing that he lied to you about, he then will turn around and accuse you of what he talked you into doing. Okay? So it, he brings accusations against you. And so we talked about how to deal with that. And this week, the final week of this message, we're going to talk about the enemy, Satan himself. His, one of his main titles he loves to boast in and operate in. He is the destroyer. The enemy, Satan, our destroyer, or he attempts to destroy. Let me put it like this. Right out of the gate, John chapter 10, verse 10 says this right here. The thief, the thief, again, talking about, talking about our enemy here. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and here it is. Say it with me. Destroy. But look at Jesus' word. Now, this is Jesus. All this is written in red. If you have a red letter Bible, all this is the words of Jesus here. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Friends, just in this verse right here alone, right here it is, right there, that verse right there, you've got a choice. There's two options in life. There's good and there's evil. There's bad and there's good. There's God and there is Satan. There's the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of darkness. And here's the promise from both of them. One's kingdom, the verse kingdom it talks about here, wants to steal kill and destroy everything about you your life your family anything about you the other one says i gave my life that you can have a life on this earth and you can even walk in an abundant joyful filled with the power of god life now folks again it doesn't take much of a scientist to figure out on on face value which one you probably want you probably would say i want that life the man that i can enjoy that, 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 that i've got life and i want that abundant life but yet so many of us will fall for the deception and stay in the accused, and continue to live our life away from Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, not following him as much as we should, not serving him like we know we could. And therefore, when we fall down on that, we, we, just, we just let ourselves down in the things of God. But notice here, one of his names here, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, the word destroy means this right here. There's several definitions, and I'm going to save one definition, the final definition, because it shows up later in, in this message today. But the word destroyer means, or destroy means this right here. It means to extinguish. It means to terminate. It means to obliterate. obliterate it means to demolish, to devastate, and to annihilate. And there's one more word, and we're going to cover it here in just a minute. But look at the very first word, extinguish. If you built a fire, the devil come along and pour water on it or, or turn a hose on it, okay? He don't, he don't want you to be on fire. And, and I really believe that in the last several weeks especially, Man, the church has been alive outside the walls more than it has ever been in my lifetime. I know that. And again, if you go and you research the internet searches, prayer, the word prayer, has been searched more right now since the internet has been invented. So there are people looking at, man, I need to be praying. What is prayer? Who do I need to pray to? You know, what about God and praying? And so, man, thank God that the word is getting out about prayer and church and, and, and the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And so, again, there are people seeking right now, right now more than ever before in our lifetime, guys. And that's why we are, again, I keep hammering this, we have got to be the light in the darkness, okay? And so again, that's what it means. Now, I can guarantee you because there is this upswell of people who are thinking about Christianity, thinking about God in the church and the Bible and the Word of God, and there's this upswell of this. Well, guess what he's trying to do? He wants to come in there and destroy that. He wants to come in there and, and if people are getting on fire for God and turning their life around and going, you know what? This life on earth is so volatile, it is so fragile, I need something that I know is everlasting that no matter what happens to me, maybe in this earth, 
whether I, I die, which we're all going to do eventually. No, I got news for you. Nobody's getting out of here alive, guys. You're not going to make it out of this, out of this earth alive. We all going to face a certain death one day, but man, when you when you're born again and you know who you are in Christ, death is not a problem. Life is is everlasting for you. And so, when we get wrapped up into that, He wants to steal what's going on now with this upswell of people looking at Christianity, looking at God and the relationship with God and what to be praying. And I, I guarantee you, man, He's doing everything He can. And if you've started looking and maybe you ain't getting the results you thought you needed, let me ask you this. Did you surrender your life to Christ? Are you not just picking up the word in a, in a moment? Are you staying in the word? Build your faith. Build your most holy faith by praying in the spirit, getting in the word of God, singing praises to him and worshiping him, okay? So, so you know, I, I, I can remember I was actually pastoring during 9-11. And we had what we called the 9-11 the bump. Man, churches were capacity right after the ter ter terrorist attack in 9-11. Every church was at maximum capacity. We had, to, we had people standing in the back, and husbands sometimes couldn't sit with wives, and it was great. I mean, the house of God was full. But in, in all honesty, anywhere from five to six weeks after that, when the nation seen that we wasn't probably going to war or nobody was actually going to invade America, guess what happened? All of a sudden, man, emotions begin to calm down, and we're not going to go to war like we think we are, and it's going to be invading. There's no more terrorist attacks probably going to happen here. Man, the church went back to its normal members. Now, again, we gained some people who really locked in, but we don't want to pass this opportunity up. Man, whatever we got to do to help you, help lock you into your faith, take you on your next step, man, please drop us an email or get in contact with us on maybe what you're struggling with or anything, any questions you have. We would love to help you no matter where you're at in life with where you're going in life and where you hope to go one day, which I hope with me you're going to go to heaven one day. But here's what I want you to know. Your first note today is the destroyer, the old enemy, most of the time, in many, most all circumstances, all he's got to do is get things started. And then you know what he does? He usually sits back, gets him a cool drink, if there is a cool drink in his area, and just begins to sip on his tea or whatever and watch us destroy ourselves. So many times he just gets the ball rolling, then he steps back, and, and us as humans in our emotions, in our feelings, not having a solid foundation on Christ, we literally will finish the work that the enemy wants to destroy our lives with. We absolutely help him sometimes. We're, we, we take the right hand of, of, of that junk and bring it into our lives and anybody else. And we're, when we get mad, we get frustrated, we get upset, we, we lose our temper, we, we listen to half-truths. And, you know, I, this, this message is going to kind of bounce around a little bit, so I need you to stay focused with me this morning. But I, I've heard this many times out of... Many different, it, this goes all the way back to Abraham Lincoln in one of his speeches up through the ages. Several generals have talked about this. Even uh, Hitler had mentioned this before that the, 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 the America that we live in, the United States of America, established in 1776, okay, our nation, America. Wow. I mean, there's really not been nothing to compare it with in, in sense of, of all of history, okay? And we're going to cover that here in a minute, and I'll show you that. But it's amazing that many people have said that America can only be destroyed from within. That right now there's no force exterior outside of our borders that can destroy us. Now they can do some damage, but the American resolve, the American people, the only way they can be destroyed is if they destroy themselves. Okay, and I've, you've probably heard that if you're old enough. And, you know, there's no saying if you give someone enough rope, they'll hang themselves. Okay, and so I've heard these many quotes right now, and, and I can prove it to you that, that sometimes that when we get divided and we get out of unity, that, man, we, we, we are opening the door for the destroyer to walk in. And that's not just as a nation, that's as a person, that's as a marriage, a family, on your job. Anytime unity is broken and people get at odds with each other, man, the destroyer is, is just sitting back and now watching us destroy ourselves, okay? And, and this past few weeks when Kay Ivey come out and announced, a lot of us churches thought, man, we're going to be back this Sunday. We're going to get to see people. And then, wah, 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 it didn't happen, you know. And I've seen pastors with all kind of different reactions on, on social media and stuff and, and just blast the governor, oh, this right here and all oh, this, that, and the other. And again, it's like we're tearing ourselves apart. And I, I, in my honest opinion, I wished you were here, okay. But I, I kind of get it. I kind of don't. And how would you like to be sitting in the governor's seat right now of any state, okay? Because no matter what he or she says, it don't matter what they say, somebody's going to be ticked off. 
okay? That's just all there is to it. If, so there are some people who are wanting everything wide open again. Just, just open everything up, and, and here's the thing about it, and you even have to tell people nowadays because some of them can't figure it out. Even if everything opens up, I mean wide open, no restrictions, you don't have to go out. Okay, you don't have to get out of your house. You can stay quarantined yourself. You can have your groceries brought in. So there's that side. Then there's the other side of like, no, we don't want anything open. It's still a risk. You're putting my life at risk. And, and literally, there's some cities that where if you're not wearing a mask, they'll, they will call you neighbors calling against neighbor, calling the police. Hey, my neighbor's not, not acting right. Come, come arrest them. Come give them a ticket. And we're turning on each other and we're shredding each other apart. And again, please don't let fear take us into a place where we're, we're just ripping each other apart and Satan's plan is just continuing to roll. But again, nobody, nobody is going to be happy no matter what she does. Okay, if our governor, which is Kay Ivey, if, if she opens up the state, there's going to be people mad. If she leaves it closed down, there's going to be people mad. So again, again, there's things I don't like about what's going on, but you know what? I'm going to see the glass half full, and what I can do, I'm going to do, and I'm not going to fall into the trap of just yang, 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 because I'm going to stay in unity, I'm going to stay in love, and we will be back together soon in the name of Jesus, and that's my prayer. But hey, again, until we do, we're going to communicate like we are not going to stop and allow anything to stop the love and the fellowship of the body of Christ in this earth and trying to get up a whole bunch of new people to come into this joyful thing we call the Bible and Christianity, okay? Now, I want to turn here. Have you ever heard the saying that one day, and if, even if you read the Bible, you'll understand this. Now, you've got to stay with me. This may be a little hoiky-joiky, as we say sometimes from Brother John. I've always heard it said that one day, that there's going to be a one world government or a new world order, or whatever you want, conspiracy kind of thing you wanted to go into. And I'm not, a con, not operating in conspiracy theories here. But, but again, if you read the Bible, you know that nations are going to fall. And I'm telling you right now, for there to be a one world government or a new world order or whatever you want to call it, America as it is cannot stand. Because as long as America is, has its freedoms, as long as we have our a means to, to defend ourselves, as long as our churches are up and operating and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, there we are a major stumbling block to anyone in any group of people or any, any, any weird organizations that want to come into a one-world government and take freedoms away and, and have more of a dictator and no citizens, just subjects again, okay? And as long as America has this and our God and a way to defend ourselves and our freedom and our Constitution intact, Man, we're holding the world together many times, okay? And so I don't want to get too far off deep in that, but in 17, it's weird, our nation was birthed in 1776. And in 1776, there was a report released by a man, and I'm going to give you his name. He was a European historian. His name is Alexander Fraser Teitler, T-Y-T-L-E-R, not Tyler, but Teitler. Let me give it to you again. Andrew, Alexander Fraser Teitler. You can look him up on the internet. You can Google him yourself. And what he done in his lifetime, he studied every civilization that rose to greatness, from, from, the, from the Egyptians to the Roman Empire to the Ottoman Empire to all the way to England. And plus, he, of course, he couldn't study America because we wasn't around in his time. But he released this in 1776 as America was becoming a nation. And he says, now, over all the nations that he's ever studied, there tends to be a sequence, a cycle that they go through, okay? And I'm going to give you the cycle here in just a moment. But he said the average cycle that a nation remains in its greatness and in power is around 200 years is all they ever last, hardly. 200 years. And right now, America is around 240-something years old, okay? And I want to progress through this, and I want to take my time here this morning, but I want to look at the very first thing. The very first thing is, his study found is nations that are in bondage, while they're in bondage, they don't look for anything else, but look at the notes, they go from bondage to spiritual faith. From bondage to spiritual faith, they begin to cry out to God, this burden. Man, we're, we're not citizens, we don't have choices, we're in bondage here, we're slaves, and God, we're asking you for deliverance. So they begin to meditate and, and, and to pray and get to God, and they get together, and their spiritual, spiritual faith begins to rise out of that. And then the next step, progression that he's found, and, and this is in every society, every great society ever studied, and it, it's, it's so much in ours. They go from spiritual faith, the next progression, you get spiritual faith. Spiritual faith brings into your life great courage. 
Now because you're energized and, and you know who God is and that you're not just a subject to God, but you're a citizen of heaven on earth, you begin to rise up in some courage. Faith produces courage. Then look at the next progression. Then courage produces the willingness to walk in liberty, which is freedom. When you begin to get spiritual faith, you begin to get the courage to say, you know what, I am going to be free. God made me free and man's not going to keep me down. So you rise up and you begin to get courage to have your freedom. And then you fight for your freedom if you've got to fight for it. And you do what you've got to do as free men to maintain your freedom in Christ. And then out of that, the last progression of this part, from liberty, which is our freedom, to abundance. Liberty, freedom, to abundance. Man, you're free now that if you want to start a business, you can start one. You're free to work over here. You're free to invent. You're free to loose your mind. And you're free to build God's house. You're free to evangelize. You're free to, to speak the word of God. You're free to work. You're free to, to marry your wife and raise kids in a godly atmosphere. And that is an abundance. All of a sudden, that brings the blessings of God. And he'll pour out his abundant blessings on you. He'll pour out his Our nation is so so above, the scripture says, above and beyond blessed. And if you've never out, traveled outside the walls of the United States, I encourage you, man, go on a mission trip with your church or find a church that's going. And, and we're, we're going to still try to be going sometime in October, September to Guatemala. And then I'll be in Uganda, God willing, in, in, in December. But if you've never stepped outside these, these borders, you, you just don't have a, you cannot grasp how blessed we are. Even our poor quote, poor people in America are still far blessed above and beyond anything you can think or imagine compared to some nations, okay? And so, so that, that but freedom always leads to abundance, okay? Now, I want to stop there. I want to show you this progression. It started with this. Faith, faith brings courage, courage brings freedom, and freedom brings abundant blessing, okay? Now, if, if a nation could maintain that right there, that formula, the foundation is faith, then courage not, to, courage not to shrink back into a society and a, let society start telling you who God is, but staying with what your faith brought you out with, staying on the foundation of Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, in many societies, we get away from faith as our foundation. And I'll show the rest of this to you, but, but it's faith, then courage, then courage to freedom, and freedom to abundant blessings. And that, that cycle has been known in every Again, any great society from the beginning of earth has went through that first stage there. But then if they don't steward that, if they, they can, you can have abundance and all those things, but you need to stay on the foundation of faith, guys, okay? So let's watch what happens now to every society before us. Every society before us then goes from abundance, in your next note, from abundance to selfishness. Abundance. And now all of a sudden we get real selfish. The, instead of sharing and sharing our faith and staying in line with the Word of God and about others and helping our brothers and sisters, and anybody need a hand up, we'll give you a hand up, not a hand out, but a hand up. Now all of a sudden it's all about me. What's in it for me? How can I gain? How can I get blessed? I want more, 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 more. So we go from abundance to selfishness. And then the next step is when we begin to walk in selfishness, we get complacent. We get all about us, and we forget about everybody else. We even forget about God. We'll even forget about God. We get complacent with our faith. We get complacent with our worship. We get complacent in our marriage and, and think we don't have to work in our marriage anymore to maintain a good relationship in our marriage. We, quit, we, quit, get, we get complacent raising our kids. Here, here's $20. Just go to the mall and hang out. Whatever they say do, you just do down there. Whatever it may be, we just get in the complacent. i got to have more selfish stuff, okay? Now, I know this is not everybody, but this is how nations fall, okay? So selfish goes to complacency. Then complacency, then you go right into what we call apathy. You're just apathetic about everything. Doesn't nothing matter but you and your world. As long as it don't come into your personal house, the world can make laws that go against things. They can do that. They can do this. But as long as it don't come into my house, I don't care what they do, as long as it don't affect me. So I'm, I'm just apathetic to everybody else's Worst times or bad times, they're, they're not, well, whatever, okay? Complacency to apathy. And then from apathy, when you get a nation that is apathetic, they now have to depend on somebody else. From apathy to dependence. And then the last one is from dependence straight back into bondage. Now, my friends, I'll, I'll, I'll let you determine where you think we're at as a nation. 
But I think we've crested the abundance, and I think we're on the downhill side as a nation. But let me tell you something. That don't mean we got to bottom out. That just means we need to have an awakening, a revival in ourselves, or whatever you want to call it, to realize we've got to get back to our foundation of faith where we can have the courage to have the freedoms to walk in the abundant blessings of God. This is your key for an abundant life, okay? It's not from man-made. It's not in money and riches. It's not in fame. It's not in vain relationships. It is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, okay? Now, again, as I said before, America right now, we have surpassed the 200-year mark. And again, we're 40, I think it's either 43 or 44 years old now as a nation. And we're one of the youngest nations on the face of the earth. There's a reason a lot of these other nations that have existed for century after century after century, thousands of years old, because they don't have one-tenth of what this, basically, we're a baby nation. Compared to them, we're just still a, a, a child, a toddler nation, okay? And here we are, we're, the, we're pretty much the sole superpower. There's us, China, and Russia, but really we lead the way in technology. We lead the way in food production. We, we're now exporting oil. We, all of our oils is full. We, we've got oil running out our ears right now. Thank you, Jesus. But, and ain't that ironic? They tell you that you know, gas is cheaper than it's ever been in years, but you can't go nowhere, okay? But anyway, they're going to be opening that up soon, all right? But, I mean, we are the most abundantly blessed nation in the fastest time, again, on the face of the earth. And so, again, it's, it's really, it, but why are we so blessed? And, and why, haven't some, why, haven't, why hasn't anybody come taking us out? And we've been in two world wars, and then, of course, the Middle East War and things of that nation, that, you know, that nature. But uh, the words of Admiral Yamato, Yamatoto, he said this right here. He was, the, he was the general of the army, or excuse me, of the navy in World War II. And he said, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December, December 7, 1941, he said this right here. He says, let me quote it to you straight. He says, I fear all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill them with a terrible resolve. Wow. And he's talking about America. Of course, this was a different America back in the 40s. It's a lot different than it is today, but still, strong nation, okay? And then right after that, they asked him, said, why did y'all not launch an immediate land invasion? Why didn't you go ahead and invade the land of, of the United States? And here's what he said about that. He said, you cannot invade the mainland of the United States of America. There would be a rifle behind every blade of grass. And that's one reason they strategized, said we don't want, because every citizen basically is a soldier in that America. There's guns everywhere, and so we can't go into that. Now, we can go into a nation that can't defend themselves on foot soldiers and go in there and wipe them out easy. But again, as long as America has a way to defend, and I'm not talking about guns and stuff like here, you know, that's, that's your choice. If you want one, fine. If you don't, see, that's the thing about it. If you don't want a gun in America, you don't have to have one. Hallelujah. Amen. If you want one, you can get one. Hallelujah again. So again, freedom, the, the ability for you to choose how to defend yourself and your nation. So what do you do with a nation like America? If you wanted to collapse America, what do you do with a nation like America who's been over 200 years and still strong? still the strongest nation in, in America, still a Christian nation, regardless of it's on the decline or not, we are still a Christian nation. Hallelujah. Can you thank God right there in your living room, bedroom, or wherever you're at? So how, how do you do it with a people that's this strong and they're still free? They still have their freedoms. What do you do with a nation like that? Well, the scriptures is going to give us some ideas. Now, I want you to stay here to the very end because I'm going to show you how to defeat the destroyer. Okay? All right, you ready? Now, Proverbs Chapter 16, verse 18. First word, look at that. Pride. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. It's pride. If you can get a nation in, in their own pride, proud of what they're doing, look what I've done. God didn't help me none. God didn't, nobody else did this but me. God didn't help me. Nobody else. I'm, I'm all that in a bag of chips. Pride. Pride goes before destruction. And back in our list, you know, faith, courage, liberty, and abundance don't operate in pride. But let me tell you what does. Selfishness, complacency, apathy, dependency, back to bondage, all that except bondage is due to pride in our life. Okay? And so if you look at that scripture, pride, pride. What, what do we have today? People are constantly telling us, you can't tell me what to do. Right now there's a whole section of people going to the government and, and, and other people. You're not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. I am free. But yet I want other people to do what I think they ought to do. I don't want other people to enjoy the same freedom I have. I want to tell you what to do, but it don't apply to me. 
Well, we see a lot of that in a lot of different areas right now across our nation. And then also pride says this right here. You know what? We have, I went to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or whatever, or maybe one of the colleges around here. I've got this degree. I've got an MBA, a, a BS or whatever, a PhD in this. I am so intelligent that I don't know. I don't, and we really say this right here. I don't need God. In our nation right now, there's a, there's a huge part of our nation that we don't want God in our nation. Throw God out of our nation. We done threw him out of the schools. We threw God out of the schools years ago, or so they say. But let me tell you something. Students, teachers, whatever, nobody can stop you from praying in your school. Now, you don't have to go in there and make a spectacle of it. You can walk down them hallways and just pray all you want. Nothing can stop that. As long as you've got a voice, you can pray anywhere you pray. I have never been in a school system that I didn't pray going down the hallways, Okay. And, and some people, when they invite you in, I get to speak sometimes, and I pray, and I ask permission if I can pray out loud over the speakers or whatever I'm doing, and I've not been turned down yet to open with a prayer sometimes, okay? So again, it's all a mentality, and it operates through pride, but pride says, you don't tell me what to do. I'm so educated. I'm smarter than God. I've built a Fortune 500 company. What can God do for me? I don't need God. You know, so many times I see people, when they get successful, they think they don't need God anymore. You know, and, and God, in these times, sometimes there's been people saying, man, I have lost so much money in the stock market, you wouldn't believe I was going to do this, and I was going to do this, and I was fixing to buy that. I can't now. And that just shows you right there. You can have all this stuff stored up, okay? It don't do you a lick of good when you need Jesus, okay? When you need Jesus, Jesus is all that will do in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. But pride is the first thing. And then I want to show you the second thing. In Matthew chapter 20, 20, 12, verse 25, it says this. And again, this is Jesus speaking. Watch this. Now, there's a progression here, so I want to leave the scripture up here. Every kingdom, every kingdom divided against itself will be brought to, and here's the last word I want to tell you that's a definition of destroyer. I told you I was going to bring it to you right here. It is in this scripture in Matthew 12, 25. Every kingdom divided will be brought to, look at that word, desolation, wiped out, anguish, just pitiful. It'll be brought to desolation. Now watch this, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Man, what a scripture. What a, what a timely word for right where we're at. Now, in this scripture on your screen right now, I want you to look at something. There are three things called out that will be destroyed, come into desolation, and be divided and can't stand. What are they? The kingdom, a kingdom, a city, and the house. Now, in those days, the kingdoms were what we would be call a nation. Cities, they didn't have states like what we have in America here, and still there are other countries that don't operate in what we call states, okay? We have states, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, Mississippi, Texas, Arkansas, whatever, okay? We have states, which would be called cities back there, and then, of course, you break it down to the house. Now, again, most of the time you do not, especially a nation that's free and a nation that has a great defense, both military and in the, in the citizenry, you can't go in there and take them out hardly. So how do you take down a nation who is free and who can defend itself? Well, you've got to start in the city. But most of the time you can't even attack the city. What do you do? The house. You go to the house. You, start, you strike the house first. Because if you can affect enough houses, then you've affected a city and if you can affect enough cities, you can affect the state. If you can affect enough states, so goes a nation. So the kingdom, the cities, and the houses, Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy, desolate them in the name of Jesus. But not in the name of Jesus, but in the name of Jesus, we ain't going to have that. Now, but look at there. In your next note, it says, it all begins with destroying the house. Every bit of this to destroy a nation, destroy a kingdom, it has to begin in the home, in the house. Now, what's in every home? In every home, pretty much now, again, there's single people living out there today and that's who gay for you, <laughs> you know, you're doing good. Sometimes it's better to be single, okay, than to be married, okay, to marry the wrong person anyway. All right, but in the home we have what we call the family unit, okay, consisting of a mom and a dad, usually, and they end up having children. And that's our family unit. That's our, what's in the house. That's the home. And that's the number one target of the destroyer is to destroy your home, your house, your home, and everything God wants to bless with you. Satan wants to steal it, kill it, and destroy it. Now, 
What's in the home? Years ago in the home, now this is years ago, this is old school, there was a mom and a dad and 2.1 kids and a dog. I don't know what the point one kid looked like, but anyway, let's just say there's two kids. And in that home, the dad would get up in the morning, mom would have breakfast for the kids, the kids get ready to go to school, there would be a breakfast on the table, the family would eat together, pray together, maybe even go over a scripture that morning. Dad would get his lunch box and he would scurry off to work. The kids would grab their lunch sacks. <laughs> Some of y'all ain't remember lunch sacks. I do. You'd get your lunch sack and they would catch the bus or go to school or walk to school back in those days without fear of being kidnapped or, or in human trafficking, okay? And then dad would come home. Kids would get home from school, do their homework, eat a snack. Mom's cooking dinner. Dad would come home. They would, again, they would have a meal together, talk about the day, and then they might play a game at night or sit, watch TV together or whatever, okay? And that, for years, that was a standard, okay? But after the wars, and, and again, opening up some things, and, and in the 60s, if you look in the 60s, what was 60s all about? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, baby. And then into the 70s, the disco, and the, the women's movement, and all these other movements, and taking prayer out of school, and we don't need God, and we don't want God, and we just want to do our own thing. We want to be God. And then so goes our nations, and the houses begin to have that. And then, so now, we fast forward to today, in, in the vast majority of homes, both parents have to work. They have to work to make a living. We've made it so difficult to make a living in America by, by raising the expenses of everything. I mean, you used to could buy a house for $50,000 and buy you a house. $50,000 won't even buy you a brand new truck or SUV in today's society. And so both parents have to work, and, and yay for that, amen. There, there's not, nothing wrong with women working, okay? Nothing wrong with women staying at home. Either way, okay, let, let it, you do what you need to do there. But both parents now have to be out of the home a lot. And then... Then there was this huge thing years ago, past, I think it was in the 60s, where we had this idea, our government had this idea that we will take moms, mom, if you have a baby out of wedlock, we will give you a check. We will write you a check for every child you have, okay? And guess what, though? Guess what the, the law said in that, though? If you have that child, there cannot be a man, a husband, the father of the child in the house for you to get your check, Okay? You can't have it. You can have as many kids as you want. As long as there's not a dad there in the house, you'll get a check. And this especially devastated the black community. There was whites, all nations, all, all races did it. But, but in the black community, that really hit hard, okay? And so now what do we got? Generation after generation of kids, white, black, Hispanic, Chinese, Middle Eastern, whatever, growing up without a father in the home. Again, destroy the home, you'll get the city, and eventually, years later, you will get a nation, Okay? This, is, this ain't nothing new. The devil's, the devil's been doing this with every civilization ever known to man. He's been destroying them in 200 years with this progress, okay? Destroy the home life. So you got children out of wedlock, no father in the home. And then years ago, the, the business world got together and said, you know what? We can start working swing shifts, and we can get people out of their sleep pattern. We can get people out of their churches. We can continue to destroy the homes through the workforce. And how many people do you know that work three on, three off, four on, four off, rotate from days to night, nights to days? And there was a study done years ago, because I used to work in, in manufacturing, and I'd get these magazines, of, and there was a, some scientist did a study that was a doctor too, and I forgot, I think the life expectancy of someone who worked, in, either you worked days, or you worked first, second, or third shift, and you worked that all the time, and you would sleep appropriately, well, they come up with, again, these different swing shifts and rotating shifts. You work days this week and nights this week, and you work, like I said, three on, three off, whatever their schedule was, that they literally can reduce your age, your life expectancy, by up to 12 to 15 years. And guess what? When you retire and you don't live as long, they don't have to pay out as much money. And the other benefits is they're going to help destroy the home. And let me tell you something. A lot of times when people miss two or three weeks of church, they don't come back. Because they get that, they, they've worked four or five weekends in a row, and they're like, hey, this weekend we want to go to the lake. This weekend, man, we want to run down here and go camping, or we want to run to the beach, we want to go to the mountains, and yay for that. I'm, I'm not against taking a vacation. We'll go next week, honey. Then the next week comes along, well, we, let's do this with our friends. They're going here. And, you know, i got to go back to work next week anyway, and we have no good family time on the weekends because the kids are playing ball year-round and doing school year-round now and all this stuff. And so, so they just virtually, the church has been hurt with the swing shifts. And there's a lot of pastors talking right now. We're worried that when this is over, that there'll be some people who won't come back to church because they've gotten apathetic, lazy of getting up and coming to church. But I think, that, you know, for us, it's going to be an explosion of church growth. That's what I'm believing for. 
so, so we look at that, and, and that gets brought into mindsets. And then, after you do all that to destroy the home now, you redefine marriage and family. You redefine what marriage is and what family is against God and start teaching a generation that marriages can be with whoever and whatever. And again, I know that's a, that's a subject a lot of people don't like to hear about, okay? But it's nevertheless... Marriage is between a man and a woman. That's the way God created marriage. Marriage is not an institution of government. It's not a society program. It's not a social program. Marriage is an institute created by God in God's purpose for his plan to multiply the earth. Okay? So if, but now we redefine that and we can help continue to destroy homes. And then to top that off, we can just redefine what gender is. If you want to be a whatever, you just claim you're that. Again, pride not needing God and thinking you're your own God, that you can just be whatever you want to be. If I want to be, a, you know, I tell people all the time, if I go stand out in my car and go vroom, 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 that, my, car, my, my garage where my car is at, and I stand beside my car and I go vroom, 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 that doesn't make me a car, guys. I am a human being. I am a male human being created by God with a DNA inside of me that is a man, okay? No matter what else I do, I'll never be nothing but a man. A matter of fact, when you dig people up a thousand years from now, they will identify them as male or female by the chromosomes in their body. It doesn't matter if he called, him a, he called her himself a she or she called herself a male. If you're identified by your DNA, it's going to go back to the way God created you. And folks, when we get off that foundation of faith that builds us into courage, that takes us into liberty, that takes us into abundance, and we get that home destroyed, and we get that home getting off the word of God and what God says a family is and what God says a family ought to do and behave like, when we get out of that, we set ourselves up to go back from being citizens of a nation to being subjects to a, to a dictator, okay? I'm telling you, look at every nation. Study this for yourself. Now, I know I've took a long time on this today, and I want to shift gears here just a little bit and say, you know what? It's not just the destroyer's plan. And like I said, the very first thing, the destroyer will start something sit back and watch. And let me tell you something. He will use anything or anyone, including people who say they're Christians and churches who say they're Christian. He'll use a church. He'll use a pastor. He'll use a, a deacon. He'll use anybody he can to stir up strife and divide a church, divide a, divide a family, divide a nation. Okay? He does it all the time. Okay? And so that's not the, you know, Jesus Christ has been misrepresented by people and organizations who say they're Christian, okay? And I'm going to give you one, that, and I don't care. I'll call it out by name. There's a, there's a church up in somewhere up north there. It's called Westboro Baptist Church. And I, 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 I didn't even really want to use the word Baptist because I got a lot of great Baptist friends. They're great people, great churches, man. Love the Baptist church. I love any church. <laughs> I love any church that's preaching Jesus out of this. Okay, hallelujah. So we're not in competition, and, and today we understand that, that we're all competing for one thing, and that's to get more people, as many people to go to heaven on the, on the love and the salvation that Jesus Christ offers through this word, not our denomination, amen. And so we're, we're not in competition. We're partners with our churches up here. We love our churches up here in Eva and anyone that's got Jesus in common with us. But if you take that and you look at it, this church up there, Westboro Church, I'm not going to say the denomination, and even my Baptist church, they'd be like, man, they're nuts. They're not part of us. They're independent. They're, they're, they have no part of us, okay? And we, we, we condemn their actions because they hate Jews. They hate Catholics. I mean, they're verbal with hating Jews and Catholics. And these are the ones that when a soldier comes home that's killed in battle, they will protest that soldier and tell that soldier how it's going to hell. And they hate the American way. And it's just a, again, but they, they, they ha you know what? They tote the same Bible you and I tote. And they twist the words. And they pervert the word of God. But now in their eyes, again, the deceiver means, you know what the worst part about being deceived is? You're deceived. You think you're absolutely right when it's absolutely wrong, okay? And so somewhere, that, that church, that, that, that body, whatever they are, they've gotten deceived by this, but yet they're using this as a destruction force instead of a saving grace force. And so, now, I want to pose a question to you this morning. What do you think is the most divisive day that America ever sees? And I want to tell you the most divided we are as a nation comes around every seven days, and today is that day of the week, Sunday. Sunday, the, the, the United States of America is divided on Sundays more than it's divided any other part of the week. Because what do we do on Sundays? We go to our church, 
And we made a huge mistake back in the day of civil rights. We said, okay, y'all can have y'all's church, and we'll have our church. So you got black church, you got white church. And, it, and thank God that there are some churches, <laughs> inner city and everywhere now, to where they are starting to break that mold, and you see black people and white people coming together and worshiping and, 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 and serving together. I thank God for that. That is the way. God, man, I want to tell you right now, I don't care what color you are. I don't care what nation you belong to. I don't care what, anything. As long as you come in here and you've got, you're covered up with some kind of clothing, you are welcome here in the name of Jesus. If you don't have clothes, you get here and we'll get you some clothes to come on in with. Amen? I don't care what color you are. I don't care what your past has been. I want to share the love of my Jesus with anyone, any color, any nationality. You are welcome in these walls here at Journey Church. Hallelujah. Amen. But we have, you know, we started this, you got, you got black church and you got white church and then we're making the same mistake with the Hispanic generation. There are churches right now going, man, we have our church, and then after we get out, we have Hispanic church on our facility. And I'm like, no, let's don't do that. Bring them in in one church. Well, there's a language barrier out there, Pastor. Well, they make these devices you stick in your ears, and it'll automatically interpret what's being sung and what's being said into just about any language in America. Invest in that. And if, if you speak another language, I'll buy you a set where you can sit here and listen. I don't want to have a separate church. There is one church church that God's coming back for and if he's coming back for one church why can't we be one church now one church in the name of Jesus now I want to say something to you that might break your heart I got news for you there's not a Baptist Jesus there's not a church of God Jesus there's not an assembly of God Jesus there's not a Nazarene Jesus there's not a Lutheran Jesus there's not a Catholic Jesus there's not an Episcopal Jesus there's not an independent Jesus there's not even a non-denominational Jesus there is not a traditional Jesus nor is there a contemporary Jesus my friend I'm telling you today there's only one Jesus and it's the God of this Bible Jesus Christ King of Kings Lord of Lords he does not belong to a denomination he is the Son of God this is his word. He is for you. He's not against you. And he's here to bring unity, not division. He's here to bring unity to the people of God, not division. Jesus does not belong to your denomination. Okay? Denominations are a man-made thing, and I'm not against them, but I'm not for them when they start separating. Because let me tell you something. I love it because you'll have Baptists and Methodists and Pentecostals and Charismatics and and, and Catholics and, and Episcopalians, and they'll all work together sometimes in a manufacturing place. Man, they'll work, and they get the job done, and they'll produce. But they won't go to church together. And anytime they start talking about Jesus, they get mad, talk about one another, make fun of one another, do this, do that. And I'm like, is this crazy or what? Again, this is the destroyer set back, dropping little seeds of doubt, fear, and lies, and accusations. And then he watches us destroy ourselves from within. Guys, come on. If you're smart at all, don't be so smart that you don't need Jesus, but be smart enough to know that you need Jesus. No matter where you're at in life, you need Jesus. And i got to move quick, okay? We're going to be going into overtime this morning, all right? But look at here. Now, every denomination, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Pentecostals, the Charismatic, the non-denominations, the, the independent churches, the traditional churches, they will all say, oh, hey, we believe God and we, will, we believe there's only one God. We believe in the one God of this Bible, hallelujah. And all these denominations and non-denominations will tell you the same thing. We believe in one God. Let me touch on something that we had in our study Wednesday night that Brother West touched on. James chapter 2, verse 19. The Bible says, Oh, you believe there's one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So I tell people when they say that to me, oh, I believe in the one God. I believe in one God right here. I believe in one God. I say, welcome to Demon Worship 101. You've now made it to the same status and knowledge about Jesus and God that demons have. But here's the thing. The Bible says the demons will tremble, and we won't because we get full of pride. We get full of arrogance. We're too smart for this. I'm the only way this right here. Demon 101 worship knows that there's one God, and they tremble. Because they know that there's one true God. The false gods don't bother them. You come to them in the name of any other God, they don't back down. But you come to them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they fear and they tremble. Because they know this is the real deal. Okay? And then it goes on and says this right here, verse 20. But do you not know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Faith without works is dead. 
And I'm, I'm trying to hurry all I can, okay? But you just bear with me this morning. Stay with me. I had a talk with a pastor just the other day down in Oxford, a great friend of mine, Pastor Bishop Jimmy Cole. We were talking about their, their charismatic church, and, and we believe in all the gifts of the Bible here at Journey Church. We were talking about most denominations who believe in all the gifts of the spiritual gifts. They say this right here. Speaking in tongues is the initial physical evidence that someone has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm fine with that. That's okay. That's pretty good. Not bad. Okay, and Pentecostals and charismatic and, and, and whatever you want to call them, people who walk in the gifts, and that's their thing. That's the gift. I've got tongues, I'm, tongues, 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 and I don't want to get started on that today. But let me ask you this. If tongues is the initial gift that you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, what do you think your definition would be of the initial sign that you've been born again? Why don't you think about that? What's the sign that you're even a Christian? What's the evidence? What's the physical evidence that you can show, that you can produce, that you're just, you've just received Jesus Christ and you're walking as a man or woman of God? And my friend, it's in the Bible. Go and tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But yet so many people just want to operate in their physical gift on Sunday morning between the hours of 10 and 11 or 10 to 12, and then they, they lead no one to Christ. They share no faith outside the church. The only spiritual duties they do is inside the church where everybody else can see them. And again, we're shooting ourselves in the foot, guys. I am for all the gifts. I believe in all the gifts. I believe in tongues. I believe in prophecy. I'm, if it's in the Bible, I just absolutely believe it, okay? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm that smart or dumb, whatever you want to say. I believe the Word of God 100%. Amen? Now, it says, the Bible also says, do the work of an evangelist. Okay, we're every, every born again Christian is do the work of an evangelist. What's the evangelist's job? To give the word of God where people can be converted to the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's the work of an evangelist. And it says do the work of an evangelist, okay? But let, let me end with this right here. Jesus came to offer salvation, yes. But there's another description of why Jesus came. And this message is called the destroyer. And I'm fixing to show you a destroyer <laughs> that you won't that you want on your side, that you want to pattern your life after, that you want in your corner, that you can step out and know this destroyer's got your back. And I want to show this to you right out of the Scriptures. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. The, for this purpose, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that He, Jesus, might destroy the works of the enemy. My friend, that is, a, that is salvation comes through destroying Satan's deceiving lies, destroying his lying accusations, and destroying who somebody you think can destroy your life. There are people who put more confidence in what the devil's ability are to destroy their lives than they do for Jesus to walk in and destroy that destroyer out of their lives. You're more scared of the devil than you have faith in God sometimes. And friend, let me go King James. This ought not be so. I want your faith to rise up to such a level that you know that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And on Calvary's cross, when he hung up there, he destroyed the works of the devil. He gave you and I power over the enemy in the name of Jesus. That when we provoke the name of Jesus, demons flee. The destroyer leaves. But you've got to invoke the name of Jesus. Amen? All right. I've really got to get God. Come on up and help me get out of here. All right. <laughs> so... So I told you I was going to tell you how to do this. I'm going to give you this scripture that explains exactly how we do this. Jesus has done his part. He has destroyed death, hell, and the grave. He has des destroyed all the power of the enemy. Again, the only accessible power Satan has over you is when you agree with his deceptions, you agree to his accusations, and you fall into his destructive life, which is steal, kill, and destroy. But let me tell you something. When you don't agree with him, he can't touch you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But now watch this. You have a part to play in this. I want you to point right here and say, I've got a part to play in this this morning. Come on. I want you to do it. Point to whoever you're sitting here watching you this. Say, hey, you've got a part. If you don't have nobody there, type, you've got a part right now in the, in the comments. You've got a part. And here is our part. James chapter 4. I'm going to start with verse 7, finish with verse 8. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Look at the rest of that. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse, cleanse your hearts, you sinners, and purify, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now leave that up there just for a minute. I could preach four-part series just on this verse, okay? There's so much in here. But today, just for time's sake, I want to point two things out to you. 
out of the very first verse, submit to God, resist the devil. Submit yourself to God and resist the devil. That's our part. That is our, that's totally on us, guys. God has made everything available through the blood of Jesus. Every dominion, every power, every anointing you ever need is available, 100% available to you as a child of God. But your part is submit to God and resist the devil. That's totally on me and it's totally on you as an individual, okay? Now the word submit, let's go ahead and put that definition up there. The word submit is that Greek word right there, okay? <laughs> it means to put under and to be subject to. To be put under and to be subject to. And my friend, I'm here to tell you this morning, to put yourself under and to be subject to something means you cannot walk in pride. It means you can't think of yourself more highly than what you think you are. You can't be so smart that you don't need God anymore, that you've got it all figured out and God's nowhere in the picture. Humble yourselves. The prayer that our nations have been praying at 714 in the morning and 714 at night, if my people will humble themselves, humble Humble themselves. Submit to God. Turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Humble. Submit to God. Or have you put yourself under God? Are you, have you made yourself subject to God? Not just in a few areas, but in all your life. Have you submitted your desires? Have you submitted your, your selfish wants? Have you submitted your sin? Have you submitted your, your, your victories? all under the lordship of jesus christ have you subject are you subject to that so that's that's to submit and that last word says resist resist go ahead let's put that definition up the word resist in greek is that big word right there okay it means to set oneself to set oneself that means god don't have to come in here and pick me up like a little pawn of chest and say you need to be here no i i place myself i set myself against uh, to withstand, to resist, and to oppose the destroyer. I resist. I set myself in a position knowing the word of God now, not listening to the lies of the devil, not falling for the accusations, and not answering the door of the destructor. I place myself under God, and I use that godliness to come up in authority and power, and I resist in the name of Jesus. I resist. Now, let me tell you this right here. You'll never resist until you submit first. Because until you're submitted, you'll never have the anointing to resist the devil to the manner that he needs to be resisted in your life for him not to destroy things in your life. So there is no resist. You can sit there and go, devil, I don't want this. Devil, I don't want this. Devil, I don't want this. Get away from me. Oh, uh, you can even go as far as to learn a little Bible. Go, I rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus. You can do that all day long, friend. But if you're not submitted to God, those words just float out over his head and he pays no attention. See, when, when the enemy looks at me, he sees a body. He sees a soul. But when he sees the Spirit of God in me and he knows it's Jesus and I've submitted myself, I've placed myself under the anointing and the authority of God, that I now in my body and in my soul can walk in that authority, but it's not mine, it's the authority of the Lord's to use. He is scared of that. He flees, he trembles, and he flees without the destruction in your life. Guys, I'm telling you, it's so powerful. We're trying to resist the devil, but man, nothing seems to be working. It's not feeling right. It's not going right. Are you submitted to God? And are you doing your part once you're submitted to resist in all areas of your life? And that's key right there. And I really, I really am going to end with this. So you can't submit to God, resist. It's just certain areas. I know a lot of people say, well, I'm willing to submit my life to God in these areas. And I want to resist in these areas. But I really, I'll be honest with you, Pastor, I enjoy that little bit of sin. I enjoy that little bit of this and just a little of that. Man, I mean, I don't think it's that bad. I don't think it's that bad. And then you wonder why the rest of your life's still in turmoil. Friends, you've got a, there's an old song called, I Surrender All. It's not I Surrender Some, it's I Surrender All to Jesus. Okay? And so this morning, wherever you're at, it's time to surrender to God, submit yourself, place yourself under God, all of you, not just some of you, all of you. And it's time that you can resist all, all the fiery darts of the enemy. It says in Romans 6, he gives you a shield of faith and you can quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. Not some, but all. But it comes through submitting. It comes from being humble, not full of pride, not full of yourself, 
submit yourself to God this morning. So if you're here this morning, right now, you're with us this morning, you're watching, please don't check out. I want to give you the chance to make Jesus your Lord and Savior this morning. We always do this no matter what we're, I, I could be preaching on cats and dogs and I'm going to bring it to salvation somehow because I never want to leave any time I've been with you and not give you a chance to accept Jesus. We're not asking you, to, we, don't, we never ask you to join church. We're not asking you to join an organization, a religion. We're not asking you to get religious. We're asking you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ who paid for your sins on the cross and who loves you and is alive. He's alive and he's well for you this morning. And he wants you, and he wants you as his son and daughter, but you've got to surrender on his terms, okay, guys? And so this morning, right where you're at, if that's you, I just simply want you to have enough, enough strength in your life to say, Pastor, that's me. I'm lifting my hands. I want, I want my kids, my wife, my husband, whoever's in here. And I know it's even harder to do right now because maybe you're alone, and, and man, pride will keep you from raising that hand in front of somebody, okay? But the Bible says if you're ashamed of him, then he'll have to be ashamed of you. So there's no shame in this game, okay? Just lift that hand up. You don't have to lift it up all Pentecostal. You can just do the, the little, I'm here to surrender my life to you today. All of it, God. I want you to have everything about me, God, in my life and my family. And I'm not going to follow this destruction path that most people follow. And I'm going to be a part of making our nation great, making our nation powerful on the foundation of the faith of Jesus Christ this morning. So if you lifted that hand, I want to congratulate you this morning. If you're here this morning watching wherever you're at, and you say, you know what? We've been slipping in some areas, man. We've gotten apathetic. We've gotten lazy. We've got complacent. And we're going to be sliding back into bondage in our home, in our city, in our state, even in our nation. But I don't want my home to be one of those that's bringing this in. And you, even as a Christian, you've maybe been offended. Maybe you've acted out and you've retaliated in your own strength against people. It's time just to forgive and to press forward in the name of Jesus. So if you're here and you say, man, I just need to kind of redo some things in my life and reprioritize my Jesus in my life and surrender those areas and resist those places that maybe I think's a little fun, and I'm going to start resisting that and say how my life is blessed. Just go ahead and lift your hand up real quickly. Hallelujah. Congratulations to everyone today on the decisions you've made. Drop us a line. Let us know exactly what you've done today. We love hearing from you. There it is on the screen how you can contact us. through. You can get life at journeychurcheva.com. You can just, man, When we would love to hear from you. We've heard from a few, and we would love to hear from so many more about the decisions you made. But I want to pray with you right now and just bless you, and we're going to do a salvation prayer. Father, we thank you. Come into my life. Be my everything, God. I surrender my whole life to you, and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we hope that you enjoyed today's message. If you would like to talk to someone about taking the next step in your walk with Jesus, we want to connect with you. Just send us an email to live at journeychurcheva.com. And we want to say a special thank you to those who give so generously to support our work here at Journey. If you would like to be a part of the ministry here, you can do so by going to journeychurcheva.com forward slash give. And our mission here at Journey is simple. We want to help you discover your real life purpose in Christ so that you can make a difference in your world. Thanks for joining us today. and We can't wait to see you next time.